Hello and welcome to the Queen Bee Podcast, where the stories of regional women come alive, resonate and inspire. I'm your host, Tanya Rutherford, and together with a passionate team of women, we've painted this landscape for you. In truth, this podcast is about gathering the stories of women who live in regional and remote Australia to bridge those gaps, to create communities, and of course, to tell the richness in their journeys. Now, if anything does come up for you today, please be kind to yourself. You can share it with us, whether that's through our socials, our Queen Bee community, or you can send us a DM. Hello and welcome to this episode of the Queen Bee podcast. Today we're speaking with Nicole Amy, an advocate for youth entrepreneurship and youth as our creative problem solvers. She's got over 20 years experience in teaching and education spanning three countries, I think. Is that right? That's right. Yes, three countries. Yeah. So very, very inspirational there. She's inspired by an inspiring four young folk wanting to make a difference. So thank you Mm. for joining us, Nicole, and welcome. Oh, thank you, Tanya, for inviting me on to Queen Bee. Really excited to be on here. Awesome. So tell us a bit about your life. You've obviously had a bit of a journey. Um, Mm. Where did you start and what brought you to Bundaberg? Okay, um, I was... I lived in Bundaberg. I was originally born in Cairns, okay. um, probably about the age of three. My my mother's family lived here, and um, so my mum and dad moved here. And at 17, left, um, as you do, lived in Brisbane for a time, and moved to London, where I lived for 20 years. Uh, was that um, backpacker with a two-year plan and stayed for 20 years. Came back with a degree, a four-year degree, a Bachelor of Arts in Education and Combined Language and Linguistics. On the way back, I stopped in Dubai for a couple of years and then came to Bundaberg. So family was my draw card and um, I've got a young son. So it was really at that stage, really good to have him around my family. Yeah, awesome. Mm. Wow. (laughs) I I did the London thing, but it was only for four years and I was really homesick for at least two of them. So (laughs) Yeah, you go through phases like that. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Definitely, definitely. Yeah. Um, So... What would, and I guess coming back to your education, you've been in education for 20 years. Mm. Mm-hmm. What sort of sparked that um, shift to really focusing on entrepreneurial skills and, and mm-hmm. that, that kind of element? Mm. I get, well, I know it's always been there with me. When I was working in London, I worked in a London gritty, really tough primary schools. And um, you know, high behavioural concerns, disengagement, uh, you know, well-being, attendance, um, demographically disadvantaged areas. And we created, we did creative curriculums, which was fantastic. And it was very hands-on, interactive approach, international primary curriculums. Then I moved to Dubai and was, a, you know, worked there as a deputy of, of pedagogy and curriculum. And that was all the international baccalaureate. And looking at the transdisciplinary, then the interdisciplinary and that progression through the IB, um, the levels of engagement with students, the real world application, their their knowledge of what they're bringing from their own experiences um, enabled us to immerse them into a, a thematic curriculums. Coming into Australia, I moved out of primary and moved into the landscape of secondary. And um, we all know it can be a little bit prescriptive at times and was very immersed um, with, you know, the whole philosophy of Michael Fullen, New Pedagogy, Steve for Learning and Lynn Sharrett. And was fortunate here at Kepnock that my deputy principal, Chris Bull, was, was leading on that. And through that came the entrepreneurial education, which... Um, fits in with that developing of mindsets and skill sets, skill sets and allowing our students to have those toolkits for their pathways to employability. Mm. So that, that's my journey, a lot of creative curriculums. The, the very succinct version, because I know it's probably a lot more detailed than that. Um, tell us a bit about some of the students that you've worked with and maybe some of the projects mm. that they've come up with. 
I think I'll focus on Capnot because it's been yep. an incredible journey since 2020. Um, in 2019, I started at Capnock. I'd done a couple of years in in, in a, a local um, independent school here, and I wanted to get back to a school where it was very diverse. All our schools here are. Our school has probably got 30 to 40 percent of, um, you know, socioeconomic deprivation, and it's a real a real um, hinge from your high ATAR students to those students who are you know we work within student services in my role as year 12 coordinator to get them to school and I met Jamie Olson who is an alumni and founder of our Ingenium program and we met at an awards night and in 2000 I said to him I really want to get on board with this I want to know what you're doing and 2020 we kicked it off together remote learning happened oh my gosh I couldn't believe it but we had a real engagement with students around COVID and their own personal experience, their story, their journey, their families um, living in isolation. We are regional. It was, it was you know, different to being in the city. Um, so we launched that, that extracurricular program, the bursary, and um, Jamie, you know, supported with um, $1,000 winning prizes and, and what have you. But we we did it in a different way, that they came in and worked on it. They looked at their own, we, we gave a, you know, what how has COVID impacted on you? They brought their problems, what they saw, they solved it. They reached out in community, they researched, and that was solution focused and created a video with, apps and different um, digitech that they had um, created and it evolved from there from that we then the following year did a, a, another ingenium where we um, spoke about the UNESCO uh, Great Barrier Reef is in danger and yep. these students were coming up with biodegradable fishing gear and swimsuits and I wanted a swimsuit but I was worried that it would actually disintegrate while well, you're wearing um, it <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and we took them out to Lady Musgrave. Um, so that's where it hooked. What we also then um, linked in with was with Young Change Agents, with Margot Bryan. And from that, we've had great experiences. And our students have been really immersed in Academy for Enterprising Girls, Lighting the Spark, First Nations Entrepreneurial Capability. Currently, um, I've reinvented myself and I'm teaching economics and business and doing what we call our Entrepreneurship at Work program. Um, we have great, we've built an ecosystem and the students are engaging with our local community, which can only impact on scalability of business and their own skill sets. What have we noticed? Attendance, well-being. Um, doesn't matter if you're an A student, you can be a C or a D student and you've still got those really great ideas from the problems that they see in community. And, and do you find mm, so it's been a real journey. Do you find that all the students engage with it, like regardless of, of their background and, and where they're coming from? The ones who access it, yes. And this year, I think for me, no, I believe has been even better because I'm teaching it in year nine and 10. Year 10 is an elective. We have two classes. So we've got about 55 students accessing entrepreneurship at work. Currently, we're doing an industry innovator program and they're pitching to local council, to industry, um, working, having hackathon days. They're phenomenal. What they're coming up with just blows me away. And we sit and have those really holistic discussions and in our year nine, we're running a $20 boss. We differentiate the programs for the needs of our students. And um, that is run as a semester, as an, as an elective. And, and through that, I'm onto my fourth class with that. We've probably touched about 120 students. Last week, we took uh, some of the year nines down to a hackathon in, in Brisbane, a big career startup day, and came back inspired. They, they're now looking at their electives for 10. The year 10 students are looking at electives for a year 11. Um, with a business lens. Uh, previously, I've, I've held design-based challenges in geography. So what we're showing the students is it's not subject specific. These transferable skills can go across and permeate into different areas. And they're really talking about that. Um, you know, they used to call it flexible learning, but now they're talking about and the soft skills. The students are actually saying, these are hard skills. I don't know how to communicate oh, yeah. outside. Um, I don't know how to collaborate outside of my friends, but when we look at the growth and we monitor and track those growths against those skills, 
they are surpassing what even they thought they would be able to mm. do. Um, so yeah, we it's it for me, Tanya. It doesn't matter, and the students are seeing that they don't need to be excelling in a subject around content when the content is their base knowledge, and they can use those skills to leverage um, the outcome of of that. And we've aligned it with assessments, so they're seeing the results there. So for those mm. students who have graduated, have you noticed any like changes in terms of where they're going and what they're doing? Um, I have. I think they're becoming a little bit more dedicated to subject choices, um, being very thoughtful around that. The other thing is we're very much developing intrapreneurs in our school and Recently, we had a blast from the past day, a legacy from the year 12s that they kicked off after remote learning. Everybody got on board and they could see the connections, why we we're doing this. And it was for a not-for-profit, not-for-profit social enterprise in Bundaberg. The money would be donated to. And it became um, a, a day of not just the leaders, but the students being very actively engaged and mm -hmm. wanting to know more about the not-for-profits. What I've found as well as within the classrooms that it is spilling out and we have got, yesterday I went to have a coffee and um, a gentleman I know said, hey, you went to this career startup last day. I've got a young girl in, in our church group. She came back. You've inspired her to think about um, what she could do to become, you know, a young entrepreneur. Saw her today in the lesson and she went, yeah, yeah, we're chatting about it. I had the best day, all the skills that I learned and I want to do something with them. So when you've That's got cool. that fact, that knock-on effect and people in your community are talking about it, it's very important. Last week we took um, our economic development officer from Bundaberg Regional Council along with us on the on the on the um, career startup at the precinct in Fortitude Valley. She came back buzzing, and we're now communicating because we're looking at developing some you know entrepreneurship programs mm -hmm. next year to to develop those champion educators in our community because you know what it's like, Tanya. You work in silo. Yep. But um, and we've just started doing that with our chapter events and roundtable discussions. We've, we've got some phenomenal, talented educators in Bundaberg and combining those skills impacts on our, our young people, which is, you know, win win for everybody. Yeah, for sure. So I'm real like from what you're doing, I can sort of see how this could apply or could be used in any kind of community like it's not location specific doesn't have to be about Bundy I mean obviously Bundy's awesome I did used to live there um, <laughs> how would someone go about um, I guess starting it, they may not be necessarily being education but starting to create that ecosystem and those opportunities mm. for people to get involved mm. the only thought that kept knock is it takes a village and I was really fortunate a couple of weeks ago to present at the Future of Education Summit. And we did exactly that. I, I don't get up and present, probably like my teaching. It was very interactive. And we got the mind mapping. And the first point of call that we did here was how would it sound, look and feel in our community? Because we're so diverse. We're so different. And we, we did a mind map with that. And then the next step was to look at what we were already doing successfully and how we could, you know, amplify some of those moments. And one of the things we were doing successfully was we had some very um, supportive alumni who were advocating for this, this change in our systems for our young people. Um, I have in-kind support from them, a little bit of financial. And then it was about um, testing the waters with our young people. And they were really, they wanted to do it. I think in the last three years, we've probably touched about over 500 people, young people in our in our school setting. Yeah. Looking, listening to them, what's the problems? What do you see is happening? And then creating design-based challenges. It takes time. There were, and you know, you work very much in a silo at times. You think you're the only person doing it until you start to build those on-ramps. And um, it was probably in my second year that I started to really feel there were some connections. I've got a great um, deputy principal, Chris Bull in year 12, who advocates for this style of learning. Um, I have a fantastic head of department in humanities, Darlene Hill, who 
really saw the vision that I wanted to do and gave me that creativity and curriculum and knowing my background was um you know advocating supportive of that um she's they've probably taken big risks on me at times um and you know building connections with others we've got practitioners out in emerald who are doing you know who are who are really championing entrepreneurship um i went to Mackay this year phenomenal education happening there our regions have raw talent and i speak quite often with qut and uq with their entrepreneurship you know, Emma Jenkins and Rowena Barrett, they're taking our kids. And I quite often say to CQU, we've got to keep them here. This is where the innovation is happening. So I guess at the beginning was listening, having yeah. a vision, having an action plan that I'm just reviewing it now, went over four years and I'm seeing, you know, there's traction there. Um, different parts, Tanya. It's, it's, it's a journey, but having that story and, Throughout my story, I've been fortunate that people, I don't know, people say that I'm very good at networking and they listen to my passion, but I really feel that people in our community are invested in our young people. And our Lighting the Spark First Nations program, that was built on, on funding from Schools Plus, but Tara Blang Aboriginal Corporation, Wild, these are people that were, you know, yarning with the elders, wanting the success of the programs yeah. um it's just been phenomenal and even uh this week i'm having more conversations and and they're saying what can we do what can we bring to the table to really give our young people the best opportunity in life mm. cool. so very how fortunate do you, how do you keep yourself uh, i guess your own well-being and being grounded mm. when you've got so many things that you're doing and connecting and everything else Mm. Um, oh, that's always a difficult one. And last year, it would have been last year, I think, we had um, uh, a meeting with Wayne Gerard, chief entrepreneur at that mm. stage, and, and Rowena and Gillian Gardner and lots of people. And Damien Tracy, who is the CEO of Community Lifestyle Support here, he in you know, Advanced Queensland, and he raised that, that there's a three-year cycle for people who are building entrepreneurial or, or really invested in it. And he said, you know, Nicole, you're coming up to your three years. Um, it was a huge eye-opener for me because you run, like I class it as running on the smell of an oily rag. And yeah. passion drives you. You know about it, Tanya. Passion oh, yeah. drives you. <laughs> uh, yeah. And a vision, um, the building of momentum. And it's really easy to get sidetracked by that. And... I took a step back at, at, at December last year in the school holidays. I started CrossFit, so I guess that's replaced it with another passion, but it was more of a, a physical, mental. Um, I am very holistic and take very much care of, you know, myself, what I eat. Mental health is a, is a huge priority for me um, with, in our society for me. I just finished doing Lip Timber in September because of regional statistics with our women um, in, in regions. And I have a great network with my family and friends. My DP, Chris Bull, um, has, you know, he'll check in with me and he'll just look at me and I'll say, I'm okay. Um, I make <laughs> sure that I have moments. And I also, the beach, I love the beach. I, I like scooting, um, old style scoot, all those things. I have a, I'm a solo parent of a, a young 15 year old boy. So we spend a lot of time on the road with his sport and that's my time as well to communicate with him. Um, I have good people around mm. me and my yeah. students. I'm going through some vocal cord surgery at the moment and I have mm. to say the students in my school and in my classroom environment are phenomenal. They do care check-ins. If they hear my voice a bit crackly, I'm not allowed to speak, they tell me. So, yeah. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> Mm. I've probably gone on a lot. I could go on a lot. But then again, on the on the double edged sword, people will probably tell you that I'm not sometimes good with self care. But I do know my limits as well, I think. Yeah, and I think I think that's like not an uncommon problem because we're so used to, you know, we're creating things, we're doing things for everyone else. We're focused on the like outside of us. It it mm -hmm. sometimes takes um almost a bit of a crisis point before we actually realise that we need to s stop it and look inwards a bit more. 
Uh, yeah, and that was me last December, and mm. I felt that. I've also got a really great colleague that I sit beside in the year-level coordinators, and he quite often says to me, you've got 100 tabs open in your head. I do not know how you keep it all going. Um, and then, you know, he's great, a great sounding board at times as well with, with not just the projects, but, you know, this is happening or that's happening. Do I need to prioritise? And sometimes they'll look and go, I have no idea what you're talking about, but, yes, prioritise. So, Jim, yeah. there's just those. Um, or if you know your body needs, Saturday afternoon, I took a three-hour nap after I got back from, from being away. So, yeah. I get that. I, I'm, nice. raising, I'm raising baby piglets at the moment, so they need a night feed. Oh. So some days I'm just like, that's it. I've just got to crash out for like half an hour. What? Um, Why are you raising baby piglets? That's amazing. Uh, it, we have a, we have we have pigs and poultry. That's that seems to be our oh, thing. Fantastic. Um, but yeah, sometimes the mums, if they're, I mean, they're a lot like people. If they're a bit too emotionally mature, they can't cope with um mm -hmm. having babies so it's just a matter of like okay well let's step in and they're super cute oh, incredible that, I, <laughs> yeah incredible i have to get some photos off you share it with my students and say hey look tanya's not sleeping very well because she's looking after piglets there's a problem what could be a solution oh they'd that would love be awesome. it <laughs> i know what my mom says some stop raising what? the piglets <laughs> oh no they probably then start thinking about some app or a timer or light sensors or something like that for you i know okay. Just automated bottle feeding thing <laughs> that would be great i might pitch it to them send me some photos oh, absolutely we'll do <laughs> <laughs> so if you were if you were looking back on yourself when you were a, a young girl maybe before you went to london what would you tell mm. yourself? What oh, gosh. Do um, you know, it's really interesting because we have this conversation with our students and you probably know this, Tanya, because I go, oh, yeah, you're a teacher, you are this, you are that. I um, dropped out three quarters of three year 11. I was probably uh, not um, as, dis as engaged as I should have been and I played a lot of sport, was away for volleyball. Um, I'd grown up, you know, doing that and I... I my parents were always very much of the nature, you know, we've given you wings, spread them, do it. You know, they've always been great advocates of us being independent, us four children and, and you know, going for what we really wanted to. And, and I guess that's where my passion has come from. I've always had fantastic mother and father who um, in their own ways, very successful with their lives. Um I dropped out, yeah, and, and and sometimes you tell that to your students and they're like, well, how'd you become a teacher? I went back as a mature age student at the age of 28 in London, worked bars and restaurants, had toothpicks in my eyes to keep them open. Um, and I know, incredible. And they said, well, what did you do before that? Well, when I wanted to finish school, I cycled into Bundaberg Town and became a dental nurse, got a job there, interviewed and did some dental, radiog dental radiography and travel. But I think looking back, I had a couple of, you know, really champion teachers that I resonated with, um, my English teacher and um, a, a PE teacher, and they were just powerhouses. I'll, I'll never forget those teachers. And for myself, I know that I was always, you know, I wasn't being behaviorally challenged or anything like that. I probably chatted too much. Um, but I just would go to school and comply and I look at what we can offer our students now. And if that had been on offer then, because, you know, I'm 52, it was about, oh, you've got to do a typing course. I'm not doing a typing course. I didn't want to do a typing course. <laughs> and, yeah, so I guess I took a risk by leaving school, huge risk. I was 16. Um, I, I, I want, from, yeah, looking back, I would take that risk again. Be a, be a risk taker. Develop your resilience and um, also be really open to different opportunities because the landscape of our employment is changing so rapidly for our young people. I look at my son who's 15 and think, where are you going to be in five years, 10 years? Um, risk taking would definitely, and we I discuss that with my students and and. I'm very open with them about where I've lived and the journeys I've had and the travels I've done and, and you know, and why I did that. And I think that's 
another thing looking back on my life, have those champion educators in your life that you can talk with and know that they they might have been you sitting in that chair 20 or 30 years ago because um, we're not all built to be educators initially. Um, but yeah, risk-taking, resilience and opportunities. Yeah, cool. Mm. And it, it is interesting because... I mean, even now there, there is a real focus that there is a single path through to a career. And I think mm -hmm. for a lot of us, that's not what the reality has been. And it's certainly not what the reality is. I mean, you can go, even now you can drop out and then, you know, pick it up and come back and still yep. be on track with everyone else. It's, it's, it's not a do or die that I think sometimes it's put forward as. I agree. And, you know, I think even in our society, there is still such a drive with ATAR or certifications and different things. Um, and I look at my boy and we have those conversations and he's, he's not, not interested in ATAR. Like he went to his set plan for year 10, 12, year 11 teacher. I don't do assessments. I don't, well, he does them, but I don't want to do essays. I don't want to. And I was really um, blown away because I saw a different level of maturity and somebody who was very sure that that was the things I don't want, but wanting the, 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 you know, the set coordinator to guide and say, well, this is what you could be doing. And yeah. I think if we're offering our students those opportunities, a plethora of choice, but it's not too overwhelming for them, they're going to make decisions that are good. And they also need to know that sometimes it's okay to fail. Yeah. It's okay. It's not We're a defining not feature. No. No, and it's not going to mark your life because in 20 years there's going to be something different happening in your life. I mean, my journey was dental nursing, dental radiography, uh, working in bars and restaurants, blagged my way into that in a London restaurant. Can you, can you, do you know how to um, waitress? Yeah, sure. Never did it in my life. Um, <laughs> you know, how could it I be? Then was a how hard can it be juggling plates? I worked in the kitchen and then I did um, live out nannying, worked, did some experience in schools, became an educator. And who would have thought that my journey would have been working tough schools to Dubai to here? Um, life is is just changed in, in many ways for me. And that's what we try to say to students. And, and one of the things that I do with them as we go through and, and there's some great resources and, you know, Scott Miller talks a lot about this about, and, and the same with young change agents that you will have different um, uh, employers. You are going to change your career. You're going to change your choices. You're going to earn and learn. Um, you don't, there's going to be days where you're not really sure what you're going to do. Um, and it's really interesting, or you might want to take a paper because you're passionate about a cause and opening up for these students, you see light bulb moments. Yeah. Hey, yeah. I don't have to have. And I say to them, well, it's okay in year nine if you don't know what you're going to be. I didn't. And, you know, go home and have the chats with your parents. Did they? Oh. And it's it's really good doing that with them. They, yeah. they start to understand that it's okay to have choice and to look in, in, in a different lens into subject areas. Yeah. And it's, it, it is funny because even though, you know, the education system is very different from when their parents were doing it, for those of us who are older parents, very, very different, but it's still very similar in terms of what happens next, what happens in reality as opposed to what you think is going to happen. It's going to be random. There's going to be opportunities that are going to come up that, you know, are going to absolutely change things, but in such a great Definitely. way. Definitely. And I think that's really um, next week I'm off to Adelaide with the E3 on conference. And last year, that was one of the most defining moments of my life where I, I was with 60 educators from Australia and, you know, talking about systems change. And from that came the white paper. And I was really fortunate to be on the white paper launch with Margot Bryan and Chad Renando and Liz Jackson. You know, these are powerhouses, gurus. Yep. And sitting there and pitching it and thinking, this is what it's all about, systems change. Because, And you're quite right, Tanya, what we're doing in, in curriculum can be prescriptive and it can be actually back to when I was a student as well about the expectations. But we need to do the change because our students are not all thriving in no. that environment. And, and if we don't look at systems change, I'm really excited about the version 9 entrepreneurship um, curriculum and I've been piloting that um, 
and working, you know, we've been doing case studies on it with young change agents and now BOP are involved in year 10. But we've been working on that to align it within the economics and business curriculum. And it has been a really great eye opener for us with the skills. So that's for me exciting. Um, is it change enough? No, not in my, my not in my view. We've got lots of students who are going under the radar yeah. because what we're doing isn't working. So, yes. But next week I go back to Adelaide and this time we've got um, principals and DPs. My DP, Chris Ball, is coming um, to talk about what we do as educators and because they've advocated how we can get that going. I mean, you know, South Australia has some of the most amazing entrepreneurial learning mm. schools and visiting them is 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 um a big ideation moment for me. I come yeah. back. That's so exciting. <laughs> yeah, it is. Awesome. Well, is there anything else that you'd like to share with our audience? Well, we've got you. I always talk too much. I always talk too hey. much. Um, uh, not really. I think, you know, I just want to share that, you know, for me, I'm always open to connecting with people um, I'm on LinkedIn please I think I joke that I have more um, connections there than my personal social life um, in Facebook but you know I reach out to me there and um, just connect I think connecting is really healthy and really powerful you will feel that you're working in silos and then somebody will say this is happening and you think oh, I'm not alone yeah um, and have those and just yeah for me it's it's really good to have those those conversations and getting your story out there and that's why it's great talking with you Tanya because our story at Kepnock um in a regional setting has just grown it, a life it, of it is own. possible it doesn't have to just be the cities we can do these things no. everywhere and we'll definitely need yeah. to get you into the queen bee community so people will be able to connect with you in there as well that would be beautiful. Yes, please. I'd enjoy that. Yeah. Yes. Awesome. Well, thanks, Nicole. And we've been Thank talking you. to Nicole Amy, recognised as the 2022 Teens in Business Australian Entrepreneurial Educator. Uh, mm. She's also year, <laughs> year 12 Coordinator and Humanities Teacher, driving innovation for young people at Kepnock State High School in Bundaberg. And she also drives community engagement and strengthening the local innovation ecosystem with some other powerhouses in the area. And I'm pretty sure Damien used to be my chi chiropractor. Sure. Damien Tracy. Yeah. Was he? Yeah. Oh my God. Ask him. I'm ask him if he was a chiropractor. Out. I'm sure he was. I'm, oh, he's got so many different, <laughs> different personas there. My gosh. Uh, she's been recognised and contributed to national research alongside a team of Australian educators as part of the Entrepreneurial Educators Exchange, which is where you're off to very soon. Next and week, she, yes. And she's passionate about empowering young people and driving systems change so that more and more young people can benefit. And we're going to change the world. They are change makers. They're the change makers. They're going to be looking after us when we're old. So we better get it right. Yeah, now. We, better, we want to get them sorted. We want that good care. <laughs> I know. <laughs> exactly. But it's been a, a blessing speaking to you. Oh, thank, thank you. you. An absolute joy. Yes. Awesome. Well, thank and I hope so. everybody, um, you know, and yeah, reach out, do what we want to do, and that'll be great. Thank you very much. The Queen Bee podcast delves into the heart of regional women's experiences, their aspirations, challenges and journeys. It's a platform that celebrates their individuality, their resilience and their ambition. These tales of reinvention, adaptation, inspiration and the power of connections.